Glory be to God. How many of you know he's a present help in the time of trouble? Hallelujah, hallelujah. We do bless the Lord for all of our mothers here today. Godly consecrated mothers, we thank you. Young and old. Yes, we thank God for you today. For a few minutes before we have communion, let's go back to the um, book of St. John, the 15th chapter. St. John, the 15th chapter. This is part two today for laying a spiritual foundation for success. Laying a spiritual foundation for success. And as we continue today to look at look at this scripture we want to look and see how do we go about laying that foundation again last week we saw two words especially from St. John 15 down to the 17th verse the two words were abide and love, to abide or remain, and to love. And obedience is the key to abiding or remaining in Christ. And if we are not abiding as branches, and obeying as friends, we will never be able to face the opposition of the world. If you are not abiding and loving in Christ, you won't have much of a spiritual foundation to have success in Jesus Christ because that's what he wants us to have. And as I was thinking today on this Mother's Day, I'm so grateful for the spiritual foundation that my mother had laid for me as a child coming up in the church. And uh, back then, we had to take public transportation to church. We didn't have, I'm talking about the 1950s now. 1950s, we didn't have a lot of money. <laughs> Bread must have been 10 or 15 cents a loaf. No need dating myself, but some of y'all remember. <laughs> But it was the spiritual foundation that I'm so grateful for. And being raised in the house of God. And coming to respect the house of God. And then to fall in love with Jesus Christ. And to respect and honor him. I praise the prayer. I can't think of any thing else that was so important for even me being here and doing what I'm doing today for that spiritual foundation that was laid. And as I think about it, after working for 40 years in the school district of Philadelphia, it was that spiritual foundation that helps you be successful in the natural world. 
with a secular job. You need God. <laughs> you need God in your life. Young people hear me today, it's good. Please get your education. Please get the degrees so that you have that piece of paper in your hands and able to get ahead financially and able to get ahead educationally and academic. Work on getting that to every degree you can work on getting, getting it. But education and no salvation can bring damnation. You've got to have a balance. We know a whole lot of folks got degrees, but they ain't got no sense. <laughs> whole lot of folks got degrees, but they don't know how to love people. They don't know how to abide in Christ. They don't know what to do when the opposition comes, when you feel like retaliating and lashing out and giving people a piece of your mind. Many are in prison today because of one bad move, one temper that got out of control and there was a weapon there and they didn't know what to do but to go on and let the enemy use that flesh to exert that anger and that temper and as a result, they're in prison for life. A spiritual foundation will keep you from reaching for that gun. <laughs> When you feel like retaliating, when you feel like lashing out, when you feel like giving folks a piece of your mind, something within, oh hallelujah, holds the reins. And his grandmama used to say, let the Lord fight your battles. And if you let the Lord fight your battles for you, You've got somebody who will bring you through with victory, life, success, joy, and peace. And all of your enemies will be moved out from before your face because you have laid a spiritual foundation where you have put Jesus first. You have allowed him to be on the throne of your life and to give him the glory. So we are abiding as branches and obeying as friends so that we will be able to face the opposition of the world. And that's that last verse, that 17th verse there from the New King James Version says, these things I command you that you love one another. Jesus called the disciples to abide in him and to love one another, but their relationship with the world would be entirely different. And let's look at that. Let's read from the 18th verse down into the 16th a little bit. It says, if the world hates you, you know that it hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love its own. Yet because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, Therefore, the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. 
If they kept my word, they will keep yours also. But these things they will do to you for my name's sake, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would have no sin. But now they have no excuse for their sin. He who hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works which no one else did, they would have no sin. But now they have seen and also hated both me and my father. But this happened that the word might be fulfilled which is written in their law. They hated me without a cause. But when the helper, when the comforter comes, whom I shall send to you from the Father, the spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will testify of me. And you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. These things I have spoken to you, the 16th chapter down to the fourth verse. These things I have spoken to you that you should not be made to stumble or be offended. They will put you out of the synagogues. Yes, the time is coming that whoever kills you will think that he offers God service. And these things they will do to you because they have not known the Father nor me. But these things I have told you, that when the time comes you may remember that I told you of them. And these things I did not say to you at the beginning, because I was with you. Here Jesus had finished talking about love in the first part of that 15th chapter. And then he moves into talking about hate. It takes us to the battlefield where we experience the hatred of the world. He's talking about hatred and he used the word seven times. It seems incredible that anyone would hate Jesus Christ and his people, but that is exactly what the situation is today in this world. And some of that hatred comes from religious people. I didn't say saved people, I said it comes from religious people. And in, in just a few hours in the scriptures here, the religious leaders of Israel would be condemning their Messiah and crying out for his blood. The Lord had openly taught his disciples that one day persecution is going to come. And he mentioned it in the Sermon on the Mount and in his commissioning sermon when he sent out the disciples to minister and in his sermon denouncing the Pharisees, Jesus openly said that they would persecute and kill God's servants. And there was a similar warning in his prophetic message on the Mount of Olives. If the world hates you, be aware that it hated me. Jesus was saying before it hated you. Jesus was hated from the very beginning when he was a young child. You remember King Herod sought him out to kill him. He was hated at the end when the people rejected him as the savior and called for his crucifixion. And the same world would surely hate those who proclaim 
claim allegiance to the crucified Lord. If you belong to the world. And this is where it gets, it gets iffy because the church wants to be so close to the world. We want to be linked with the world and we want the world to think well of us. We want the world to pat us on our back and tell us how sweet we are and how wonderful we are. But he said, if you belong to the world, oh, hallelujah. It would love you as its own, as it is. You don't belong to the world, but I've chosen you out of the world, and that is why the world hates you. Jesus wants believers to be distinctive. He sets us apart from the world. His choosing and his setting us apart makes us holy and helps us grow. And our very separation from the world arouses the world's animosity. The world would prefer that we would be like them. And since we are not, they're going to hate us. Oh, I'm going to bring it down where the rubber beats the road, as Pastor would say. You can't dress like the world and look like the world and act like the world and then sit up in God's holy house and think he's going to be pleased with you in your worldliness. Ah, there's got to be a separation in God's house. Hallelujah. I don't know about you, but I'm glad to be called holy. I'm glad to be called sanctified. I'm glad to be set apart with those who know his name and want to be glorified with Christ Jesus and lift him up as Lord and Savior of our lives. Oh, somebody ought to shout hallelujah. Look over and tell somebody it's going to cost you something to walk with Jesus. So throughout the Gospel of John, it's evident that the religious establishment not only opposed Jesus, but they even sought to kill him. As he continued his ministry, there was a tide of resentment, then hatred, and then open opposition towards him. So the disciples should not have been surprised when Jesus brought up the subject of persecution, for they had heard him warn them, and they had seen him face men's hatred during his ministry. Listen, until the Lord returns or until we die, we must live in this hostile world and face continued opposition. How can we do it? The secret to the victory is you've got the presence and the power of the Holy Ghost down on the inside of you. Somebody ought to throw up your hands and say, thank God for the Holy Ghost. That's how you're going to make it. You couldn't make it. We wouldn't be able to take it. We wouldn't be able to stand it. We would lash out in our flesh. We would give folks a piece of our mind. We would lay down our religion and cuss folks out from the morning to the night. But the Holy Ghost, my God, hallelujah, helps you hold your peace and hold your tongue and let the Lord fight your battles for you. When you walk into that job on Monday morning and you know they've put your name through the mud and they've talked about you and they've lied on you and they're scheming and conniving to get you out of that position, it's the Holy Ghost that let you walk in that office and say, good morning, everybody. Hey, hallelujah. God loves you and so do I. It'll throw the devil off of his tracks. It'll throw the devil off of his tracks. If you know how to turn the situation upside down and give him the praise when you know you're hated when you know they don't like you and don't have a reason not to like you. It's because you've got God down on the inside of you. Ah, 
hallelujah, you've got another spirit living on the inside of you. The spirit of the Lord. And then Jesus said in that 26th to the 27th verse, he said, when the counselor comes, when the comforter comes, whom I'm going to send from the Father, the spirit of truth who goes out from the Father, he's going to testify of me. This verse states that the Son would send the counselor, the spirit of truth from the Father. There is actually no contradiction for Jesus said that he would send the spirit from the Father. Even in John 14, 26 and 15, 26, it identifies the Father as the one who would send the Spirit. And the verse adds an extra detail. The Son would also send the Spirit. Thus the Father and Son together would send the Spirit. Now Jesus used two names here for the Holy Spirit brought this back I, I, I saw it and then you know how you read something and then you go to read it again and the spirit opens up another illumination and revelation to you he uses two names for the Holy Spirit right here he says counselor for comforter and spirit of truth the word counselor conveys the helping the encouraging and the strengthening work of the spirit as he represents Christ. And then the spirit of truth points to the teaching and the illuminating and the reminding work of the spirit. So the Holy Spirit ministers to both the head and the heart. You need the Spirit of God to minister to your heart, to strengthen you and to comfort you and to heal you in this wicked, ungodly world. You need the Spirit of God to come in and comfort you when others have put you down and have put you out and don't want you in their clique and don't want you on their team and don't want you on their side. The Holy Ghost is a comforter. And he will do for you such and rise up within you till you don't even care where the folks don't want you in their clique. Your feelings ain't hurt. You ain't got no animosity against him because the Holy Ghost done gave you joy and peace and life that their association can't even do nothing for you. Somebody ought to shout hallelujah. They think they doing something to leave you out and to hurt your fear. You don't know how you just freed me. <laughs> hey, glory, you don't know what you just did for me. You done put another dance in my step. You done put another smile on my face. You done gave me what God could do for me. He ministers to the heart and he ministers to the head. He gives this old tired brain rest, gives this old tired brain direction, gives this old tired mind guidance on what to do in situations, how to open your mouth when you need to open it and how to keep it shut when you need to keep it shut. Oh, hallelujah to Jesus. So the Spirit 
in that 26th verse is a key verse in St. John. All three persons of the Godhead are mentioned. And this is where we learn that there is a trinity, the holy trinity. Jesus the Son will spend, will send the Spirit from the Father. There's all three persons right there in that verse. Jesus the Son will send the Spirit. And the Spirit is not an it. The Spirit is a person. The third person of the Trinity. And that's who you have living in you today. Oh my God. Thank God for the presence and power of the Holy Spirit. Living in us today. Giving us wisdom. Giving us direction. Giving us discernment. Giving us guidance in this life because the Holy Spirit is a person and is God it means that the Christian has God indwelling him and if we did not have the Spirit of God within we would not be able to serve the Lord in this present world because you cannot live this Christian life in the flesh you cannot serve God in the flesh. You cannot do the work that God has called you in your strength. You need the presence of Almighty God. And we're to do three things. We're to walk in the Spirit. Galatians 5.16 tells us. We're to worship in the spirit, Philippians 3 and 3 tells us, and we are to witness in the spirit, Acts 1 and 8 tells us. And the Christian, the people of God, can stand and withstand in the midst of this world's hatred because of the ministry of the Holy Spirit. That's the only reason we can make it. That's the only reason we are able to do what we do because you've got the presence of Almighty God leading you and guiding you. So the Spirit as comforter encourages the church. Now, let me begin by clarifying the word world. By world... Because the term is used in scripture in at least three different ways, it can mean the created world, the world that was made by him that John 1 and 10 talks about, the world of humanity, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, or society apart from God and opposed to God. And we sometimes use that phrase, as the world system to define it. For example, when you listen to the radio or in the news, you may hear the announcer say, and now the news from the world of sports. Obviously, the world of sports is not a country or a planet where everybody lives who is connected in some way, but uh, the world of sports refers to the plans and the organization and the activities and the philosophies uh, that are a part of sports. And some of these things are visible and some are invisible, but all of them are organized around one thing. It's organized around sports. And the world from a Christian point of view involves the organizations and the activities and the philosophies and the values that belong to a society without God. That's what the Bible speaks generally about when it speaks about the world. It's speaking about a society of people who are without God. And some of these things may be very cultural. Some others may be very corrupt 
corrupt, but all of them have their origins in the heart and in the mind of sinful man and promote what sinful man wants to enjoy and accomplish. But as the people of God, we've got to be careful, as the word says, not to love the world and not to be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your what? By the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good, that acceptable, and that perfect will of God. Why does the world system, including the religious world, hate the Christian, the one who believes in Jesus Christ and seeks to follow him? And Jesus gives a reason. We are identified with Christ. If they hated him, they're also going to hate those who are identified with him. And in John 15, 20, Jesus quoted the statement that he made earlier, and the logic of it is clear. He is the master. We are the servants. He is greater than we are, so he must receive the praise and the glory. But the world will not give him praise and glory because the world hates him, and the world must hate us who love him. If, if with all of his greatness, and all of his perfection, Jesus does not escape persecution. What hope is there for us without imperfections? And this principle is seen in some of the other images of the relationship between Christ and his own. He is the shepherd, we are the sheep. And if they attack the shepherd, if they attack the shepherd, it's going to affect the sheep. He is the master teacher and we are the disciples, the learners. But it's encouraging to know that when God's people are persecuted, the Lord enters our suffering for he is the head of the body and we are the members. And that's why he said, Saul, Saul, Saul who became Paul. He said, Saul, why persecutest thou me? Anything that the enemy can do to us has already been done to Jesus Christ and he is with us as we suffer. Aren't you glad that he's walking with you? He's talking with you. He's giving you guidance and direction in every area that you need so that you are not walking alone. You are not walking by yourself. You are not going through persecution and trials and temptations by yourself. The Lord is with you. The Lord is there. Lo, I'm with you always. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. My peace I give unto you, not as the world giveth do I give unto you. So let not your heart be troubled. And this is what you've got to remember as the people of God. If you're going to have success and abundance in this life, you've got to know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the Lord is with you that he is giving you direction because you're walking in the spirit. And to walk in the spirit means to have fellowship with him to stay with him regardless of what people think regardless of how people treat you regardless of your family members and them not wanting to have nothing to do with you and your religious self my God who cares about it God has called you for this time and for this season and for this purpose to be a living witness unto Jesus Christ. And he will be with you to fight your battles, to take you through everything that you're going through because you're not walking alone. Yes, the load may get heavy, the road may get rough, but Jesus is there with you, keeping you, guiding you, leading you. Who 
who's going to separate us from the love of God? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or perilous or as it is written for thy sake, we are killed all the day long. We're accounted as sheep for the slaughter, but nay in all these things, we're still more than conquerors through him that loved us. And I'm persuaded that, that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor principalities, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, neither height nor depth, nor any creature is going to separate me from the love of God in Christ Jesus. That's why the word says, occupy till I come. Cast all your cares upon me, for I careth for you. And when the enemy comes in like a flood, he'll raise up a standard against him and give you victory to stand and not fall. Hast thou not known, hast thou not heard that the everlasting God, the Lord, the creator of the ends of the earth, fainteth not, neither is he weary. There is no searching for his understanding, for he giveth power to the faint, and to them that have no might, he increaseth strength. Even the youth shall faint and be weary, and the young men shall utterly fall, but they that wait, I said they that wait on the Lord shall renew their strength, they shall mount up with wings as eagles. They shall run and not be weary. They shall walk and not faint. Stand on your feet and praise him. Throw up your hands and declare, I've got the victory. I've got life, I've got hope, I've got everything I need in Christ Jesus. Lift those hands and thank him today. Somebody ought to be glad. Somebody ought to rejoice. Somebody ought to lift up your voice and glorify him. He made you. He brought you. He's going to provide for you. He's going to open doors for you. He's going to make a way for you. Lift up those hands and thank him today. Oh, hallelujah, hallelujah. My God, I feel his presence all over this house. Open that mouth and praise him. Open that mouth and lift up your voice like a trumpet. Lift up your voice like a trumpet. with you yet.
Jimmy, I don't feel no ways tired. Oh, hallelujah. How many of you know, how many of you believe that? The paradox of that song is that though the physical body may be tired, but your spirit says the opposite of what your body feels. You're going to tell the devil in his face, I don't feel no ways tired. You may be in a wheelchair. You may be walking with a cane. You may be sick in your body. But faith says, I don't feel no ways tired. Because I done come too far. How many of you done come a long way? God done done too much for you. For you to get tired now. You don't know the Lord Jesus Christ. Come on and step out from the crowd today. Come on this way. Come and receive Jesus Christ. You don't know him. You haven't confessed him. You haven't made him Lord of your life. Come on and step out from the crowd today. Come and receive Jesus. Oh, hallelujah. The road may get rough. The hills may be hard to climb. You've got Jesus to walk with you. Come on and receive him. Come on and receive him. Oh, hallelujah. Step out from that crowd today. Come to fall. It's going to be Sing it again, I don't. 